guys. Tonight I'm sitting with Dr. Greg McBrayer, Assistant Professor of Political Science of the Ashbrook Program at Ashland University. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for asking me to be here. Uh, it seems like a really uh, interesting project you guys are working on, having folks come in and talk about the election. I think it's a good public service you guys provide. Thank you. Sure. What do you predict the impact of the coronavirus will have on our country during and after this election? Sure. Um, well, I guess it's on everybody's mind. Um, it seems to me that uh, the numbers already seem to support that it's having an effect on voter turnout. There seems to be a lot of early voting uh, because folks are trying to make sure that they can get out and some, some folks may be a little scared that they don't want to go out on election day. So I suspect, though one, one doesn't know, that there'll be a lot of early voting and therefore turnout might be higher this year than in 2016, possibly. Mm -hmm. I suspect that the higher turnout, I suspect that the higher early voting turnout will probably help Biden, uh, I suspect. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And so what we'll have after the election? Uh, that's a good question, too. Um, after the election, maybe they'll get back to the business of uh, they've been trying to put forward the stimulus package. And so maybe, maybe once the sort of uh, all the frantic sort of goings on with respect to the election in the past, maybe mm -hmm. they'll be able to turn to sort of some uh, policy issues at that point. Definitely. I hope, yeah. What qualities do you believe our country needs in a president at this time? That's a good question. Um, I guess if I were being honest, I would say uh, it's, it's no different than any other time. The, the qualities you look for most in a president are sort of prudence. So the president, as far as he is the chief executive, um, so you want somebody who can act in a, in a measured way and act um, effectively with energy. Uh, this is how the Federalist Papers talks about it. So as, as opposed to a congressperson, sort of a senator or a congressperson, you sort of want somebody who's capable of deliberating calmly and sort of, and, and sort of compromising and figure things out. In a chief executive, you need someone who's capable of exercising more discretion when like if an emergency comes up or something like this. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so a uh, Federalist 68, in fact, uh, where Hamilton talks about the qualities that he hopes that people will elect in a president, I think that's a place I would look. Someone who sort of has judgment, someone who's respected, um, someone who's done something that uh, the citizens can all admire. I think that those are the qualities that I would say are most uh, important in a president. You, you know, I, the way that I would answer it, the way I would answer it with students is, you know, look at your, your the presidents from U.S. history and, and, and ask yourself, what are the qualities that you admire most who have been most successful and, and what do you admire about them? Mm -hmm. uh, so John F. Kennedy is a, is a great president. Uh, early on he made some, some sort of mistakes, uh, Bay of Pigs fiasco, but with the Cuban Missile Crisis he seemed to have handled it with a great deal of um, care and he, he brought people in that were sort of very important who were good at giving him advice. Lincoln similarly, right? Mm -hmm. So in addition to possessing uh, sort of prudential qualities of his own, he seems to have surrounded himself with people who were capable advisors. Uh, but that's not to say he always deferred to them. Uh, others will know better than I, but he, he sort of often would sort of counter, sort of uh, generals would say we're going to do X, Y, or Z, and he would say I don't think that's a good strategy and, and sort of replace them. So uh, that, that's for me, that's how I would answer it. You sort of look at who are the best, and then that's, you know, just like if you're trying, who do I want for a good point guard? Who do I want for a good quarterback, right? Mm -hmm. You're like, well, who's been really good at that? And let's get someone like that. Right. Yeah. That's a great way to look at it. Yeah. What differences do you see happening in America's current foreign policies if Biden is elected president? Yeah, so uh, again, Lydia, that's, that's a good question. And I suppose that for some, I, I imagine for most voters, they're more interested in domestic policy. Mm -hmm. um, but there, there would be pretty significant uh, ramifications for U.S. foreign policy. I'll, I'll say a few controversial things that I can then back away from. Look, my honest opinion is it probably won't change much. <laughs> okay. Right? But to where it will change or where it could change, I suspect that Joe Biden could be better on China than Trump has been on China. I suspect that Joe Biden could be worse on the Middle East than Trump has been on the Middle East. Okay. So uh, what Trump has done in the Middle East, you know, give credit where credit is due, has, has yielded some pretty serious positive results, I would say. Uh, but by and large, he's been relatively soft on China, despite all of his uh, recent sort of uh, rhetoric, I think he's actually been quite soft on China. Uh, I visited Hong Kong, I grew up in East Berlin, I happen to be very sympathetic to cities that are surrounded by communist countries. Uh, and I don't think that the administration, I don't know what they could do, but the administration, in my view, hasn't done enough to sort of protect Hong Kong and Taiwan in these troubled times. Mm -hmm. One might hope that a Biden administration would be a little tougher on China. Some other issues I would say, um, so Trump pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord. I would imagine that's something that uh, Joe Biden would probably pursue. Uh, Trump has typically gone it alone in foreign affairs, right? Not looking to collaborate necessarily with other countries. Right. And so I could see a return to an attempt to try and, and work more multilaterally with other countries. Whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing is a different question. But I would, I would imagine that Biden would at least try to do that. So there's a number of things that would change pretty significantly, I think, in foreign policy. For sure. Yeah. 
How has the COVID-19 virus and President Trump's response to the virus affected U.S. diplomacy with other nations? So this is now year four of President Trump's administration. I, I kind of feel like most countries around the world have a fairly settled view of the Trump administration and U.S. foreign policy under mm -hmm. President Trump. And so I don't, I don't think that his handling of the coronavirus has changed much. I don't, it's certainly not improved to other countries' views of, right. of the U.S., but I don't think it's worsened them either. Um, I, I suppose, yeah, so I don't, I don't think necessarily that there's been a whole lot going on. Uh, in diplomacy, per se. Um, I, I do have some more remarks on that, but I think you have maybe a follow-up question that I can sort of try to add to that. Yeah. Um, has President Trump's COVID-19 response protected the U.S. or damaged it in regards to international relations? Yeah. So just make sure we're talking uh, so that listeners or viewers will understand. We're, we're talking about international relations. So mm -hmm. not how has he handled it domestically, but how has he handled it, handled it internationally. Uh, and there, I would say, uh, has it helped or damaged? I mean, um, Speaking of it as the China virus, so the rhetoric could sort of be inflammatory toward China, but I've actually seen no evidence that they seem to be very upset about it. Um, it seems, again, not to have had much of an effect. Early on, we seem to have been having this, the shortage of the proper equipment, if you recall. That seemed mm -hmm. to have been problematic. But now it looks like we're actually exporting um, respirators. So we seem to have sort of turned and we're actually helping other countries. Uh, the Canadian, here in Ohio, right, the Canadian U.S. border is still closed, so there are significant travel restrictions around the world. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that has uh, been somewhat damaging, I suppose, to the United States' interest, the fact that other countries are now uh, less open to United States citizens visiting. But again, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure that there's been a huge effect to international relations on the, on the COVID front. More, it's much more of a domestic thing, I would say. Okay. Yeah. President Trump is spending less on TV ads and holding more live campaign rallies yeah. in Ohio than Vice President Biden. What are the motivations behind these two different campaign angles? Sure. I suspect that why, I don't, first you have to know what's going on psychologically in Mr. Trump and Mr. Biden, uh, and secondly, what are their advisors saying is going to work and these kinds of things. But I suspect that in Trump's case, this is what worked for him in 2016, and it's difficult to sort of change your mode, especially when it's been successful in the past. For sure. Um, so I think that that's a big part of it. I mean, the evidence, I mean, you, you turn on TV and watch him at these, um, when he's giving these public displays and, uh, you know, the, the crowds are sort of very enthusiastic. And so he seems, it seems to be sort of working for a certain segment of the population, I would say. Uh, why is Biden not doing those? I mean, he's expressed, uh, his, he's, he seems to be sort of, um, taking much more seriously in his view the the coronavirus. And so I think he would, he would say we shouldn't be having these big rallies. This mm -hmm. seems irresponsible. Uh, and so I think that that will sort of explain a little bit about, about the way that he's been going about trying to campaign. Um, I imagine both of them are going to be very seriously campaigning in a handful of states over the next month, Ohio being principal among them. Definitely. Uh, because it seems like Ohio had been sort of relatively safely for Trump, but now it seems to be, it still seems to be safely Trump, but maybe a little more uh, up in the air than it had been a month ago or, or so. I mean, okay. yeah. yeah. What key factors should the public be paying attention to in this presidential race? That's a, an interesting question. I suppose it depends on what you mean. So if you mean what should they be paying attention to election night, I think that they should be watching the results of Wisconsin and Ohio and Florida, maybe even Arizona, maybe some other small states. Mm -hmm. uh, so of course you're going to be paying attention to that. But if you're actually interested in watching the election with a view to where do we go from here, if you sort of think I really love this country and would like to see it sort of fare well in the future, I would pay attention to some of the election um, exit poll data. So there are political scientists uh, who will sort of stand outside of polls. This is just a terrible job to me. Uh, and they will sort of ask people questions. You know, what was the most important issue to you? Why did you vote for so-and-so? Why did you vote for Biden? Why did you vote for Trump? And the answers to those questions can be very um, informative for how we, how we proceed or where we go from here. So for example, um, if a large number of Biden voters say, well, we, we didn't actually like Joe Biden. We were voting against Trump that might make it harder for Biden to sort of press a sort of aggressive agenda if he's elected. Uh, and, and presumably he would sort of realize that and sort of maybe work to compromise. I mean, if Trump wins again, uh, then again, that would mean a, a sort of different set of things. Why do people vote for him? Where did he make gains? What key constituencies did he make gains? So uh, I suppose from my point of view, I, I'm more interested in, like the results are going to happen. There's not much we can do about that, but we can start to begin to ref reflect on what does one do after the election? And, and by the way, God willing, there will be an answer uh, on election night, but you know, who knows how these things work out. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. McBrayer, for thank joining you. me tonight. Yeah. 
Now back to the Election 20 update set.